Uh, thank you all for being here. I should also say I'm a professor of the Committee on Degrees and Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality. That's a very important um, program for me. Um, I'm a professor of literature and the arts, and uh, quite frankly, I sometimes feel more comfortable and freer in writing than in extempora extemporaneous speech. Um, so I've actually um, prepared um, a few uh, pages, um, a few of my own and the last two of someone else whom I think you'll recognize. I grew up in the rural south of the United States during the Cold War when the threat of atomic annihilation manifested in duck and cover drills would every now and then punctuate and puncture the daily pledge to allegiance that we were all required to recite. I grew up during the civil rights movement where the natural, naturalized racism and petty but profound daily violence of many of my teachers and preachers was put on trial in the proverbial court of public opinion the water cannons against peaceful demonstrators and the firebombing of black churches punctuating and puncturing the dreamy American rhetoric of egalitarian exceptionalism. I grew up during the Vietnam War where the naturalized norms of masculinity appeared for many years to spell out the destiny of all good boys as testosterone-fueled killing machines drafted to fight one of the many neo-imperialist wars of this, that this country has waged and continues to wage, wrapped up, to be sure, in the self-congratulatory garb of freedom and democracy. I came of age, as it were, with HIV AIDS, where the naturalized norms of heterosexuality, conflated onto citizenship itself, appeared for many years to spell out the destiny of all bad boys and more than one bad girl as premature queer corpses. I came to something like intellectual maturity in a series of universities and degrees, BA, MA, PhD, where the very deployment of the I and the appeal to emotionally freighted personal experience that mark my words here and now were repeatedly and resoundingly abjected as a falling from and a failing of true intellectual maturity measured in terms of neutrality, objectivity, and dispassionate critical distance. In the midst of all these comings and growings, I discovered feminism and historical materialism, as well as African-American, Latino, post-colonial, and gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered critical models that dared to question and often even to dispute and reject the institutionalized fetishization of neutrality and objectivity of the sort of which is on display today in pronouncements by the president of this university and others in positions of administrative power at the institution, the university, and I suppose the corporation, do not take political positions and are, it would therefore appear, objectively and neutrally above the fray, beyond politics. However reiterative and familiar the claim may be, it sounds, I submit, a false note, one in which disingenuousness Trump's serious, sustained public self-reflection, let alone self-critique, institutional self-critique, part and parcel, I would argue, of a much-needed national self-critique, which, which would do more than perfunctorily justify capitalism, especially in its profligate corporate wheelings and dealings, and would do more than demonize anything that smacks of, of the public thing, or res publica, or more pointedly, anything that smacks of socialism. By the time I was tenured, whose function I had always been taught is to allow people of privilege like myself to question the embedded enduring structures of privilege, but whose actual function seems to me to be more along the lines of fatter salaries, self-complacency, and an unquestioning assumption of privilege typical of the meritocracy. By the time I was tenured then, by the time I was supposedly all grown up, the Cold War had morphed into the war against terror, and Roosevelt's declaration that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself had been refashioned in a massively cynical governmental and media onslaught as the politics and, yes, the economics of fear, of us against them, of right against might, of reason against madness, never mind that our right and reason over and again 
took the form of waterboarding and a deadly revitalized Guantanamo, of drone bombings and a glut of mercenaries to buttress a superficially volunteer military, of invasion, occupation, and destruction once more, always once more, in the name of freedom and democracy, peace, freedom, and democracy. Anyone who dared question such a deceptively reasonable portrayal of right and reason, deeply complicit with the logics of a self-regulating, deregulated market, was almost immediately saddled with the charge of something anti-patriotic and, of course, anti-capitalist, or in perhaps more devastatingly academic terms, with the charge of something romantic to the point of delusion. That's when Larry Summers once characterized and characterized me in a public forum as, I quote, a gooey-eyed idealist who studies Spanish. <laughs> Fear, in short, <laughs> has marked my, I do study Spanish, <laughs> uh, the language of many of our janitors and uh, other service employees here. Fear, in short, has marked my life, and no doubt the lives of many others, arguably all of us, from the I to the we. Fear of nuclear war and terrorism, of economic depression and a shattered American dream, of the unraveling of family values and of the reconfiguration of families otherwise. Fear of a truly secularized, let alone socialized society. Fear of queers and immigrants and so-called welfare mothers. Fear of the homeless and the unemployed. Fear of Muslims, and for that matter, agnostics and atheists. Fear of global warming and the denial of global warming. Fear of Darwin and of Marx. Fear of science and fear of religious extremism, Christian and Jewish definitely included. Fear of falling play, of, of fear of failing to play the normative part of patriot and person of faith, or of failing to play the normative part of the professional intellectual, the professorial intellectual, the dispassionate, ever-objective, constitutionally neutral professor, where tenure appears to be measured in terms of eternal gratitude for a lifelong job and job security, and complicit silent with the machinations of one's employers. Fear, in fine, of speaking out, of exercising rather than simply mouthing freedom of speech, that very ideal which we are now being told must be counterbalanced by, with concerns also articulated as ideals over safety and security, concerns, that is, which are positively ridden with the rhetoric of fear and that are indeed fear itself. Here, the fear that is adumbrated is not just that, is not just that the movement, this movement, might wax violent and that students might be harmed, but perhaps, just perhaps, that the corporate forces that saturate this and other universities might find themselves exposed, like some emperor stripped naked, his ugly little willy dangling in the wind, even as he continues to screw us over and over and over. That the movement which brings us here together has been charged with past and present violence, and hence with the potential for future violence, even while at least one university professor, president, refuses to pledge explicitly that the police who are supposedly here to protect the students, eternally infantilized by paternalistic platitudes that discount the fact that almost all students here are of age or old enough to kill and die in war. So the police who supposedly are here to protect them, I repeat, should refrain from resorting to pepper spray and other tools of violence. This our president has yet to pledge against. In the shell game of accountability and responsibility that the administration seems intent on practicing, the fear of violence is issuing only and always from those who protest, those who dare to exercise freedom of speech as the freedom to speak otherwise, and perhaps even to speak truth. Truth not very veritas, but truth to power. This needs to be called out, critiqued, and resisted in turn. This critical calling out is why I'm here and why have un I have unfurled my little I, my abbreviated education in the politics and economics of fear. For it is my belief, indeed, my conviction, that I am not alone. And that fear, one of whose more archaic definitions is, and I quote, a mixed feeling of dread and reverence, end quote, that fear is rampant, 
even among those who would cling to the discourse of objectivity and neutrality of an above and beyond politics. At least a dozen senior colleagues from at least five of Harvard's faculties have expressed to me, privately of course, and I will not name names, their, they've expressed to me their fears that speaking out in order to criticize anything from, say, the university's investment practices to its current lockdown might be countered with defunding of their projects and initiatives. Others, from junior faculty members to the growing ranks of adjunct faculty, from tutors in the houses to graduate and undergraduate students more generally, from departmental administrators to janitors, have also expressed similar concerns. Again, in the hallways or in the yard or outside the yard. The difference being, of course, that they do not enjoy the safety and security, and yes, I'm using these words deliberately, of the tenured. I've gone on too long, but I wanted to share something in some way personal with you. Not in order to celebrate the personal, but rather to dissolve it, to bring it into play and work and activism with others, with us. Meeting with a number of those most involved in the Occupy movement just a few hours ago, one of them insisted, quite rightly I think, on the importance of a moment of individual self-reflection and self-examination, a moment of personal testimony, if you will, to the multifarious pervasiveness of fear in our society, our university, and in and out of our classrooms. Somewhat like addicts who need to recognize, verbalize, and share their experience of addiction in order to put the brakes on it and keep it in check, we might do well, I think, to recognize, verbalize, and share our various experiences with and of fear, and in sharing them, hopefully render them collective. And sharing them, enable, that is, solidarity, that will, that will always cause many of the most cynical to roll their eyes and their heads in disgusted wonder. It is in this spirit that I'd like to invite all of you to verbalize and share your thoughts and feelings. Thoughts and feelings. But before doing so, I'd like to end with the words of another. Words that some of you may recognize, but others perhaps not. It's a fairly long quote, but I think it bears uh, repeating. I am certain, here it is, I am certain that my fellow Americans expect that I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our people impel. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly, nor need we, shr nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat and to advance. A host of unemployed citizens face the grim problem of existence, and an equally great number toil with little return. Only a foolish optimist can deny the dark realities of the moment. Yet our distress comes from no failure of substance. We are stricken by no plague of locusts. Compared with the perils which our forefathers conquered because they believed and were not afraid, we have still much to be thankful for. Nature still offers her bounty and human, uh, human efforts have multiplied it. Plenty is at our doorstep, but a generous use of it languishes in the very sight of the supply. Primarily, this is because the rulers of the exchange of mankind's goods have failed through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence. Practices of the unscrupulous money changers still indicted in the, stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of the people. True, they have tried, but their efforts have been cast in the pattern of an outworn tradition. They know only the rules of a generation of self-seekers, they have no vision, and where there is no vision, the people perish. The money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truths. The measure of the restoration lies in the extent to which we apply social values more noble than mere monetary profit. Happiness lies not in the mere possession of money. It lies in the joy of achievement, in the thrill of creative effort. The joy and moral stimulation of work no longer must be forgotten in the mad chase of evanescent profits. These dark days will be worth all they cost us if they teach us that our true destiny is not to be ministered unto, 
but to minister to ourselves and to our fellow men. Recognition of the falsity of material wealth as the standard of success goes hand in hand with the abandonment of the false belief that public office and high political position are to be valued only by the standards of pride of place and personal profit, and that there must be an end to conduct in banking and in business, which too often has given to a sacred trust the likeness of callous and selfish wrongdoing. Small wonder that confidence languishes, for it thrives only on honesty, on honor, on the sacredness of obligations, on faithful protection, on unselfish performance. Without them, it cannot live. Restoration calls, however, not for changes in ethics alone. This nation asks for action, and action now. These words, as many of you have surely recognized, are those of Franklin Delano Roosevelt on his inauguration on March 4, 1933. They might be set beside as no less important values. The words inscribed on one of the currently locked gates by Dudley House. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thank you very much. So now we invite comments we ask and questions, and we ask that they be kept brief um, to under a minute, but we will move the microphones around and try to keep them in the order they are. Particularly if you've experienced some sense of fear, of retaliation for speaking out or for taking a stand that's not um, validated by administration, shall we say, but any form of fear. Thank you. Um, thank you for quoting Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who, as not everybody in the room may know, applied for membership in Porcellian and was blackballed. And that may be one of the reasons he lost whatever fear he might have had uh, about standing up to the, the rich and mighty. Um, I would like to hear you talk a little bit more about the way in which the I think clearly disingenuous language of safety has been deployed by authorities mm -hmm. in their attacks. Uh, the overwhelming portion of the violence has been uh, perpetrated by, um, quote, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the pepper spraying, the, 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 the awful s scenes that I think many of us have seen or, or mm -hmm. even witnessed or experienced. And yet, the discourse, if you will, is the safety of the very people who are being attacked. And I think there's a, this is sort of repeated uncritically in some of the media uh, and then digested whole by a public, uh, even though they've themselves seen these very images. So I just would like to hear you talk a little bit more about how, how this is. And I wonder even if there haven't been focus groups um, where they've decided that this is their best argument uh, for an, an otherwise unknowing public. I don't know about any focus groups. I study Spanish and women's studies and, and queer theory. So I'm not, in, in, I'm not privy to those conversations if they happen. Um, I think in some respects you're answering your own question. And sort of in the spirit, I, I felt like I spoke too much. I would much rather, if you don't mind, hear other people express their own concerns um, about uh, speaking out. Uh, we, we're, 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 we're constantly bombarded with the rhetoric of freedom of speech, its reiterated value. But to practice it, I have to say I'm stunned that all of the deans, it seems to be that there's this absolute tightness in the administration. There's not a fissure of disagreement. I find that hard to believe. And I do know enough to know that many of us are receiving subtle and perhaps not so subtle indications that we, we, might, we, we might think twice about speaking out and about questioning this value rhetoric of safety and security. For me, it's the Bushian rhetoric of fear that's simply been naturalized. And one of my fears is that the lockdown of this university will be naturalized in turn, that a precedent is being set and, uh, and that will uh, effectively preempt free discussion of important issues in the future. 
Um, I just want to thank you for coming and speaking today. It was oh, really thank powerful. Thank you for being here. Um, I, was, um, I was there the day the dome went up, and I was working the info desk. And the police came, and they took down our names mm -hmm. and our ID numbers. And they also took down our birthdays yeah. and our addresses and our home phone numbers mm -hmm. and our departments. Mm -hmm. And when I asked why, they said this was for the administration. Mm -hmm. This was not for the police. So since then, I hadn't really fully thought out how much I rely on um, general scholarships money because I'm so, so poor. Um, and I've been afraid uh, for, you know, since then that, you yeah. know. Um, but I made an appointment with my financial aid officer. And when I asked her if I was going to have to um, you know, explain my, my political decisions. She was trying to reassure me, but at the same time, you could see in her eyes that she didn't know. Yeah. So I just wanted to share my This fear. is exactly the kind of fear that I think is pervasive. And I'm wondering if there are any other testimonies to any experience like this. I think it's important that we try to articulate these publicly and collectively and move beyond our, this paranoid isolation. Well, um, in, the, in the sort of, Brad, it was great to hear you. In, in the spirit of self-confession, I feel, I feel oh, my wait, own, okay, good. Um, uh, I, I feel my own sort of self-silencing with respect to, to some aspects of, of this movement. Um, frankly, I feel, um, as far as the camp component of of Boston goes that it's 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 um you know it's a real liability and it's it's a real sort of fetishizing by off mostly well housed um, affluent people um uh, uh, you know a, a, a movement of people that need services um, and, and aren't getting them because they're kind of being sort of um, sort of I don't know I feel I feel sort of like romanticized as this sort of um, uh, vanguard, you know, this this territorial vanguard, and I just, I just, I, I have to say, I really feel like it's kind of productive, and I feel like I feel my own fear, um, sort of silencing that, you know, me, and I think that the mechanics of that are similar, you know. Hi, uh, thanks for your thanks for your talk. That was really good. Um, so I'm uh, one of the occupier as well. Uh, I'm going to keep my comment short. But the thing about fear, so I'm I'm a, a Harvard employee, and they also so my visa also depends on Harvard. Mm -hmm. So when I started doing um, so the first things I've I've done with Occupy Harvard, I didn't want my name to be associated to it in any way because I'm I'm worried that my visa won't be renewed. Um, I just wanted to say that um, maybe I'm not really fully conscious of what the potential uh, dangers are, but the, um, the reason I, I do this now and I keep doing it is because it gives me so much joy and hope, you know? So it's, the fear is here, but it's kind of, uh, because the, the repercussions are not, you know, I'm not gonna be tortured or anything, right? So as long yeah. as the fear yeah. is this type of administrative fear, That's financial, right. uh, you know, visa issue, um, I think the, the joy is definitely worse whatever fear there is, right? The joy yeah. overcompensated largely. Uh, but thanks for bringing that up because I think some of us are really, uh, really worried about that. So it's good you're yeah. talking about it. Thank you. I have so many fears that I don't know where to start. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll just say a few. Uh, one is that, um, you know, I, so, I'm 10 years post PhD. In the last 10 years, I spent trying to build a career in global health. And I've climbed the ladder as people who academics do. And I'm really scared to tell the truth that I know that the field is all garbage and that my work is all garbage. And that if we are going to tell the truth that we'll have to abandon it all. And if we were to abandon it all, where, what, where would it leave me? I would have left, you know, I've put in so much effort into this. And I've, you know, built a reputation that I really want to hang on to. That's one fear. Um, the second thing is, 
I'm, I'm worried that one day this movement will really start speaking the truth and that it's only halfway there yet. Yeah. And the truth is that I'm addicted to my iPhone. I'm addicted to my MP3 players and my, and my, and my MacBook. And, and I know for a fact that we can't have everybody in the world own those gadgets. And I'm, I'm scared that one day we'll speak the truth and we'll realize that we need to stop consuming as much as we consume. Yeah. And you'll be taking away from me what I'm addicted to. <laughs> and I, I, I can't let it go today. And the last thing might seem so incredibly trivial, but I'm, I'm really scared I'll die in, die in the cold. My mother won't be there to protect me anymore. Hi, Professor. Uh, thank you so much for coming and sharing today. I wanted to share a fear of mine. I'm a junior at the college, and uh, next year I'll be looking for a job. And I realized that my fear in terms of finding a job isn't so much that I will be able to find one, but it'll be like the right job. Yeah. And I feel like this is something that a lot of my peers share, of a fear of not having a job that's going to be, uh, that's going to be uh, something that they're that other students on this campus will respect. Okay. And I had this wonderful conversation with a friend of mine the other day who described herself as being a closeted teacher, somebody who really wanted to go into public education, maybe teach 10th grade English, and was <laughs> afraid of taking that job after she graduated because she didn't know if other students on this campus would be able to respect that decision. So um, as my testimony, I would present that fear of taking uh, a different profession from what most students take here. Are you, so, so, Sophia, do you want to talk about your initiative? It's a, an opportunity to do it, if <laughs> you would wanna, like to. I don't want to self-promote, but I, just briefly to say that I, I think that there's a, a potential for maybe having a more, um, some, some resolution around campus, specifically among undergraduates who have been going into consulting and finance. I think not necessarily because they're interested in consulting and finance, yeah. but because there's a fear of taking a job that they might enjoy more. Um, so we're working on trying to collect professor testimonials from people like Professor Epps and um, some other sympathetic professors on campus to kind of demonstrate ways that alternative career paths can be very fulfilling. Um, I'll just offer that if anybody would like to talk to me about this project that we're working on, uh, you can definitely find me later. But thank you so much for a really thank inspiring you. speech. Okay.